Yes. Yes, Thank you can. You. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, Rob. And I'm just going to set the timer because I'm those no means are dreadful for keeping the time. So uh, um, thanks very much, Rob, for that introduction. And indeed, thank you very much to everybody for joining in uh, today for the webinar. The, my contact details are there on the slides. If, please feel free to reach out via email or indeed via Twitter. The whole idea of today is to try share with you, as Rob said, um, Moodle reports that we use to help inform our practice. And what I've done is the conscious of time, I've tried to cram so much into so few slides, but conscious of time, what I've done is I've split it between what's available in core Moodle uh, and then what's available through plugins that we've decided to incorporate into our Moodle instance. The main thing that I want to get across to people when we are talking about analytics and reports and data is your view of the data may be different and your perspective may be different to somebody else's, but there's always the bigger picture to be looking at. And when you are looking at the bigger picture, what I would do is encourage you to use that phrase up the top, measure what you value and not the other way around. Don't value what you measure. Uh, a mistake can be made, I've seen it made right up to the top uh, in institutions where they will choose a figure to start valuing because they have it measured. Like student satisfaction for argument's sake, uh, people have hung so much on that, uh, whereas maybe it should be student learning we're looking at, student attainment we should be looking at. Uh, but measure what you value and not the other way around. The talk is going to be split into three different perspectives, looking at it from a Moodle admin and analyzing all the data that you have available to you. Then from a teacher's perspective, I always look at the what's in it for me, the YFM. Um, <clears throat> so what is in it for the teachers, uh, the data that they can get on. And then I want to highlight some plugins that we have used um, within DCU. So at a site-wide level, very, very easy to look at Google Analytics. Why would you look at Google Analytics? It gives you data. So from, from us, we own uh, Moodle within our institution, the Teaching and Learning Unit, uh, which we call the Teaching Enhancement Unit, are, are the system owners of Moodle. And we want to see how we're getting on. We want to see, are we getting progress on this year versus last year? Are we getting more uptake from our students, more uptake from our, our lecturers? Are they spending, not only is there more users accessing it and more sessions, but are they spending longer on it once they're there? Um, maybe they're interacting more with books and with lessons as opposed to just clicking on a link to download and so on. Um, so Google Analytics can give you a tremendous amount of in, uh, information, but for us, it gives us information, not just comparing one time period to another, but telling us what devices our students and users are, are using, what browsers they're using. So that will influence, well, what uh, support resources we make up and where do we prioritize. In our case, the majority of our users are in Chrome. So we make sure all of our tutorials are in Chrome, our screencasts. Um, <clears throat> our timings, when is the site particularly busy and when is it not? So when can we have a downtime uh, to try do upgrades and all sorts of different bits and pieces. Very useful information coming from Google. Looking into Moodle itself, we analyze the activities, what is actually being used across the site. Um, <clears throat> are there loads of assignments being used? Are there loads of books? Um, and again, it can give us the indication, are they being used in one faculty versus another? Or um, do I need to, to put more training resources into one particular plugin versus another, or one particular activity versus another? So those activity analytics are available under the plugins in the admin uh, section. Also, I find uh, the analytics on quizzes incredibly interesting, and I'll get into them a little bit more detailed, but what makes it more attractive to me is it gives you the full breakdown of what questions are being used. <clears throat> People will say to me and, and sort of say like that, um, oh, MCQs, that's all you can do in Moodle quizzes. Actually, the Moodle quiz engine is amazingly powerful and we can show the breakdown of what questions are actually being used and then maybe identify champions and say, well, 
the, the, the group that are doing the calculated questions there, I can see from the analytics, they're all based in the engineering faculty. Maybe I can pinpoint some experts there who can then showcase their experience to the rest of the faculty or university. It also enabled us to see where we didn't see the number of quizzes go up, but we've seen the number of question types go up and the number of questions being created. And that uh, was a good thing in terms of academic integrity because the more quizzes, sorry, the same number of quizzes were having more questions within them and the variance according. Um, <clears throat> looking specifically at quizzes, under the admin panel, a teacher can actually dig into the data behind it, not just seeing how many students got it and what the average attempts were. You can dig in a little bit more and look and see are your questions any good? Looking at the facility index, for example, will tell you how easy the question is and the discrimination index tells you how we, uh, good the question discriminates the A student from the C student. So all of these bits of information are readily available in, in Moodle. You don't have to be a, a statistics expert to, um, to, to get those figures. In this particular one, we looked at the logs, the standard logs, but we were able to see who watched resources, who engaged with resources and who didn't. And then the teacher ended up looking at what their uh, results were for particular assessments. And in this particular case, the lecturer was able to say, well, those that watched it had statistically a better uh, performance in their exam versus those that didn't. And again, that was quite useful. Um, <clears throat> I whiz past, I'm very conscious of the fact you only have three and a half minutes left, so I'm going to fly through them, but you can have activity completions and see who's not engaging. So we can see straight away here, Jess isn't engaging, so I need to reach out to Jess as a teacher and uh, see how we can get her engaged, see what the issue is. Course participation, you can have a particular module and this particular example, it is a, an assessment, who has engaged with it and who hasn't, and you can choose students to send a message to then maybe as reminders and so on. So that's the course participation report. Moving on to the plugins, we have a plugin called the ad hoc reports and just a table, just to, uh, to two tables on this particular screen. And I don't expect you to be able to see the data, the actual figures, um, but to explain what we were able to do is look at the engagement across our faculty over the last couple of weeks um, since COVID-19, see where the activity is, see where we need to support staff. <clears throat> and indeed the, the bottom table down the end tells us what quizzes are coming up and where we will potentially have issues in terms of server loads. We have 200 students logging on to do this particular quiz at this particular time and so on. So we can reach out to lectures in advance and try manage that distribution of assessments. Sticking with the, that, we have a plugin developed by LTS, um, <clears throat> which actually give us the uh, ability to have tags on courses and that enables us to pull reports and pull data. This particular one gives an assessment timeline and it tells you, it tells the lecturer of English 101 what assignments are for their students who are in English 101, but the entire program. Um, so all the different modules, the English lecturer knows when the law assessments are on and when the, the business uh, assessments are on and so on, because you can pull the report across all the modules from a particular program. Uh, this one is around accessibility, where it's built by Brickfield Labs. We look at the, <coughs> um, the, the, the um, accessibility of the course, so we'll see where there's any errors uh, coming up. Are the, the, is the alt text there? Is the uh, web links that they done properly? Is the tables laid out properly? All these sort of bits and pieces generates these reports on your course content and we can do reports on a program level, on a module level, and indeed on a faculty level. Gives us huge information to inform our practice. Um, and this is the sort of uh, tables that it can generate for you. Again, telling you where the errors are. So where we need to, as a central unit, target our professional development. <clears throat> the uh, My Feedback plugin is excellent because it can tell you 
who's engaging with the courses, how many non-submissions you've had, how many late submissions and so on. And you can even break it down within a course across particular students. If you are a, um, a course coordinator or if you are the mentor for a particular student you can, or group of students, you can see how they're engaging with the, the program. And the, the last slide here from the, the my feedback gives you a spread of the marks and sees how the students are actually performing across the individual assessments. What I want to do is finish off by reminding you within this short period of time, and I'm very conscious of the fact that was a whirlwind tour, to measure what you value. Uh, to identify what you're looking for and then go looking for the statistics. Don't go looking at the data and then try to figure, oh, I could use this data for that and that data for the other. Find out what you value and be driven by that. Put the pedagogy first all the time. Thanks very much. I know, sorry, Rob, I've gone a few minutes over time. But I Morag, you can kick off whenever you're ready. Okay, hopefully you can see the PowerPoint there now. Yeah, perfect. Excellent. So thanks very much, Rob, for the opportunity to present today. Uh, my name is Morag Munro. I'm normally based in Maynooth University, um, but for the last while, like most of you, I've been working from home in um, Straffan and it's a beautiful sunny day today here. Um, I hope it's as nice where you are. Um, so today I'm going to talk about how we have been using Moodle H5P in the context of the IOA Enhancing Digital Capacity Project um, and as a means to develop our educators' competencies in line with Area 2.2 of the DigiComp Edu Framework. So for those of you who are not familiar with DigiComp Edu Area 2.2, um, this area is primarily concerned with creating and modifying educational resources. Um, so specifically, it supports educators to modify and build on existing openly licensed resources and other resources where that's permitted, to create or co-create new digital educational resources, and also to consider the specific learning objective, context, pedagogical approach, and learner group when designing digital resources and planning for their, their routes. As with all of the DigiComp edu areas, there are associated progression levels and also proficiency statements. And these range from newcomer right down to pioneer. So why are we looking at uh, DigiComp edu in particular in relation to this framework and the particular competency of creating and modifying digital resources? Well, I think H5P is a really great way to engage both uh, novices, but also more ex expert educators in respect of modifying and creating digital resources. The H5P editor is really quick and very easy uh, to use, and it's a great way to augment videos with digital enhancements and also with interactions. Um, I've also found that it has great cross-disciplinary applicability um, and that it can also be used for many different types of learning activities. It can also be used to help educators to develop skills at different levels of DigiComp Edu. Um, so and that will depend, I suppose, on the educator and how they want to develop and use their H5P resource. And then finally for me, H5P is really a quick win in terms of staff development. Um, participants consistently express that they feel that they've managed to create a useful and high quality resource in a short period of time. And that's really great for confidence boosting and supporting people to dip their toe in the water and think about what else they might be able to do now that they've built their confidence. So I know that most of you may be familiar with H5P, um, but just in case you're not, I'm going to just quickly show a very quick demonstration of H5P and how it works. Okay, again, so you should be able to see my screen. Maybe, Rob, you might just confirm that. Yeah, we can see that, Morag. Excellent. So I'm just going to play a very quick, quick H5P Moodle video. Seven steps to hand washing. Step one, wet hands. 
Step two, rub palms together. Step three, rub the back of hands. Step four, interlink your fingers. Step five, cup your fingers. Step six, clean the thumbs. Step seven, rub palms with fingers. Okay, so that's just a really quick example of a H5P video. Um, so you'll see that I was able to add lots of different interaction types to a screencast. So I was able to add hyperlinks to external resources. I was able to add tables. I was able to add um, different types of questions and so on. Um, so that's just an example of some of the things that you can do. So what are the potential applications of HFP? Um, well, I think it's a really good way to do what I just did there, to augment existing videos or screencasts that educators might have developed. Um, it can also be very useful for things like lab setups or lab walkthroughs, um, for creating animations of processes or of systems, um, for creating virtual tours, or demoing software and giving software walkthroughs. So now I'm just going to talk a little bit about the different contexts in which we've used H5P and the approaches that we've used. So here are some of the different contexts. Um, so we have one main introductions for our educational technology. We've used H5P there. Um, we've also used it in the context of standalone workshops, um, either focusing primarily on H5P or on H5P combined with screencasting. And I've also introduced participants on our accredited programme in learning and teaching in higher education to H5P as part of their introductory module on that programme. In terms of the approach that we take, one of the first things I do is Make sure that I explicitly link the activities that participants are going to engage with with the DigComp Edu competency areas. So for in this example 2.2, creating and modifying, I make sure that participants are clear that that is the area that they're going to be developing skills in. I'll then generally get participants to spend some time articulating the pedagogical rationale for the resource that they want to develop. Um, depending on the context, we'll either get them to choose or develop the video that they're going to augment. And then again, depending on context and depending on how much time we have, I'll also try and get them to think about how they're going to measure how successful that resource is when it's used with their students. And then finally, for the remainder of the workshop, I'll work with them to support them to develop their H5P resource. At the end of the workshop, as at the start, um, we take some time to link the activities that participants have engaged in with DigComp Edu. So, for example, I'll point out to participants that they're now able to consider the specific learning objective context, pedagogical approach and learner group when adapting or creating digital learning resources. And I'll also tell them that they are now able to create digital resources. I'll then direct them to next steps in relation to the DigComp Edu framework. So for example, in this case, I would say that next steps for you might be begin to understand different licenses attributed to digital resources and the implications for their reuse. So I just want to, I want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions. So just, I suppose, in terms of some concluding thoughts, um, I have found that H5P, interactive video is a really great starting point for supporting educators to develop their skills in respect of DigComp Edu Area 2.2. I do have some areas of concern, um, however, um, and they're probably in many ways beyond the scope of the discussion today, um, but I just wanted to highlight them um, so that you can bear them in mind if you are going to be using H5P with colleagues. Um, so the first concern is in relation to copyright. Um, it is possible to augment most YouTube videos via H5P. It's also possible to upload any file that you have in MP4 format. Um, 
But with that said, we really do need to ensure that we are cognizant of any copyright issues um, and particularly with working with educators as an educational technologist, um, it's something that I always have to the forefront of my mind. My second concern is in relation to accessibility. Um, unfortunately, some of the H5P interactions don't fully comply with the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines um, 2.1 AA. Um, and that is a big area of concern for me. Um, that said, H5P do seem to be working on this. So I'm not sure how I am for time, but um, thank you for listening. Um, I'm going to end the presentation here so that we have some time for questions.